From the Heritage Foundation, I'm Tim Desher, and this is Heritage Explains. This is the second podcast in less than a year we have dedicated to the rise of anti-Semitism in America. It was a big deal then, and it's only getting bigger. When we put together the episode last April, it was hard to find bits in the mainstream media talking about the rise of anti-Semitism in our culture and schools. Beyond basic news reports, nothing. But it seems like they are finally catching up. Last night, Jews around the country lit the menorah for the final night of Hanukkah, one night after a man broke into the New York home of an Orthodox rabbi and stabbed five people who were there to celebrate the holiday, at least one of whom is now in critical condition. Now, this attack follows the murder of three people at a kosher market in Jersey City just three weeks ago, allegedly carried out by two individuals driven by anti-Semitic ideology and hatred. And in between those two attacks, there's been an unnerving spate of anti-Semitic incidents and assaults on the streets of New York City against Orthodox Jews. It's called anti-Semitic activity for what it is. And I think that is when you have, especially the Jewish people who have been uh, over the history marginalized and, and put in positions in which they have endured the Holocaust, they've endured many things over time in which people uh, are not focused on. I think the biggest thing, though, is, is let's take a step back. Why, do, why is this out there and why do we allow it to go on? No people group, no matter who they are, should be uh, terrorized by others who simply hate them. One of the challenges we face is that you know, anti-Semitism is a bipartisan issue. It is an all-partisan issue. It is not an issue that is just connected to one particular racial group. It is something that infects and morphs and defigures people and communities. And it's something that we have to be re- ready to speak out against. They are right to say anti-Semitism is a bipartisan issue. Hate is hate, we agree. But it gets more complicated when we look at how frequent and where these attacks originate. According to a recent study, anti-Semitic incidents jumped 48% from 2016 to 2018. 30% of these incidents took place at universities or in non-Jewish schools. In addition, several prominent people on the left, including two members of Congress, are on record in favor of the harmful boycott, divestment, sanction policy against the nation of Israel. Now, for those who don't know, BDS boycotts Israeli investment or businesses and acts to undermine Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. So who is responsible for this growing problem? Some people say it's President Trump, and others say it's people on the left. As Americans, we have to stop this uh, historical amnesia that the, uh, that the country is now on. It's not just on this issue of anti-Semitism, but it's also uh, about the founding of the country, you know, where we came from as a nation. We're, it's really getting harder and harder to talk to, uh, to, uh, to Americans about what Americans are, what we stand for, and it's mainly because either they don't know about our history or what they do know is wrong. That's Dr. Kim Holmes. He's the executive vice president of the Heritage Foundation. He's worked here for over 32 years and frequently weighs in on these issues. On this week's episode, Dr. Holmes talks about the rise of anti-Semitism in America, who's responsible, and what our response should be as a nation. Dr. Holmes, I noticed a recent comment you made, and and I'm just going to quote it here. It says, I never thought I would see the day anti-Semitism would return as a serious threat to the Jewish people in Europe and America, but that day has come. This is now a problem because the left has legitimized and given space for anti-Semitic opinions and stereotypes. Okay, take a breath. There's a lot in that uh, single statement, so I want to start from the top. You have been covering this stuff for a long time, so why now? Why, after all this time, why now? Well, let's start about, first of all, how old I am. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'll be 68 years old in a week. So by that, I mean my generation is the post-World War II generation. And so when I was growing up, the Holocaust and Nazi Germany was still, you know, 15, 20 years earlier. So my generation grew up with uh, the terrible barbarity of the Holocaust ingrained in everything we knew. It was in the movies. It was on television shows. It was in our education. Uh, and and anti-Semitism in particular was something that was absolutely forbidden. So that's what I grew up with. And now uh, you see uh, m- mainly because of the Palestinian issue. Hmm has opened the gateway on the progressive left to anti-Semitic stereotypes about Jews because of the conflict uh, between Israel and the Palestinians over this issue. And so since the Palestinian issue is mainly a left-wing issue, uh, this has allowed uh, the stereotypes, some of them from the Arab world, many of them actually from the Arab world, Hmm. uh, have migrated into the American and European political left and as a result of that, they think they now have permission to channel these uh, stereotypes of Jews because of that issue. There are other things involved, but that, that's what you, – you would not have seen that uh, 30 or 40 years ago. That's happened mainly as the progressive left has marched through the institutions both in Europe and the United States and moved the agenda of what is considered to be political liberalism to the far left. Can you, just for me and for the audience, so we can all be on the same page, give me a definition of anti-Semitism? It is stereotyping Jewish people in some kind of a negative way. Uh, There's a long history of how that can be done. Uh, I mean, the most obvious is calling uh, for aiding or justifying the killing or harming of Jews for some political cause, which you find in extremist uh, ideologies. Typical sort of mendacious, dehumanizing, demonizing stereotypes against Jews uh, collectively for being uh, behind some conspiracy. For example, uh, it's just like the former council member here in D.C. Hmm. making the comment about the Rothschilds uh, controlling the climate. I mean, this is a typical anti-Semitic stereotype. Hmm. Uh, giving the power to the Jews of being behind the scenes. This was sort of the the historical anti-Semitism that existed uh, mainly in Europe, but also here as well for centuries. Uh, And it sort of, it it, it did work its way into right-wing anti-Semitism in Europe, particularly in Nazi uh, National Socialism. But uh, these kind of stereotypes, though, are now finding themselves into new, not only uh, uh, people who are a more progressive mindset, but also different demographic groups that are finding themselves or believe that they are in competition with Jews in some way or the other in neighborhoods and things like that. And since we now have broken the taboo against it in our schools and our universities, uh, the price that anybody would have paid 30, 40 years ago by going out and, uh, and, and making an anti-Semitic statement is not that high these days. And the reason it's not that high is because it's been more normalized because, as I said, it migrated to the left. Uh, There are now uh, people who are trafficking and and anti-Semitic stereotypes who are people on the left. And then they will tell you, well, I have nothing to do with Nazism because it's a Palestinian issue. And it gives me, you know, justified to say it because of that issue. And they're not realizing uh, that uh, if you single out the state of Israel as being the only state on the face of the earth that has no right to exist uh, and saying, well, no, that's not uh, anti-Semitic. Well, OK, well, then what is it exactly? Clifford May at a House subcommittee hearing uh, recently, actually yesterday, um, said something very interesting. He said 20th century anti-Semitism culminated with the extinction of European Jews and the 21st century anti-Semitism is meant to culminate with the extinction of Israel. Do you see this as a possibility if this continues, these, these anti-Semitic uh, behaviors happening? Well, there was a, 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 a resolution in the United Nations some 25 years or so ago that John Bolton was involved in when he had my job at the State Department. He was Assistant Secretary for International Organizations at the time. Uh, the Zionism as Racism resolution surfaced in the U.N., and he fought very hard to get it killed, and he was successful. Hmm. And the whole idea that Zionism is racism is meant to turn this whole issue up uh, up on its head. 
So now you get this uh, perverse idea that uh, somehow that Zionism is a form of Nazism. Uh, and they start accusing Jews of being Nazis because the, of the uh, uh, of the way they uh, they debate this issue of Zionism and the Palestinian cause. But of course, we all know that on the surface of it, it's just basically a big defense m- mechanism. They say, "Well, you know, no, you're not this way. I'm that way." You know, it just it's a it's a crazy debating tactic. But frankly, many people take it seriously uh, to the point where it made it its way all the way to the United Nations. Now, why does that happen at the United Nations? There are more Arab states than there are Jewish states. Yeah, right. You know, there's an Arab League that has, uh, I don't know the exact number of Arab states, but there's more than 10 of it's them. way more, yeah. And, uh, and in the United Nations system, if you have the, a nation, you have a vote. So this is why Israel gets ganged up on um, in, in the United Nations, because there's so many uh, Arab states that are, have more votes than the General Assembly. And then... Uh, on top of that, you have mainly Europeans, uh, uh, and then also uh, the uh, you have uh, uh, many in the in the United States, uh, particularly on on universities uh, and the in the divestment uh, campaign to make anybody who invested in Israel is going to be uh, targeted for uh, for criticism. Uh, so if you've got the political left giving you cover, you've got the United Nations giving you cover. You got the European Union not so much giving you cover, but not really calling you out either right. on it. It's opening up way too much space for these ideas to operate and become legitimized. 1,800 reported incidents of anti Semitic behavior in 2018. That's what was reported. Do you think this is getting the attention it deserves? No, I don't. Uh, I have some statistics of my own here that I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is from the uh, the FBI reporting in 2018. Uh, religious-based hate crimes may have decreased by 8% from 2017, but nearly 60% of reported religion-based hate crime attacks were targeted against Jews or Jewish institutions in 2018. Wow. 60% in the United States. That's up. Uh, in 2019, there were 234 Anti-Semitic incidents reported versus 186 the year before. Uh, Hate crimes uh, overall were up 20% in 2019, but the additional 47 anti-Semitic incidents in 2019 made up the bulk of that increase. So clearly something's gone very badly in the last two years. And it's not being reported on. It's not being covered as other racist acts would, would be covered. It, right. It's yeah. boggling my mind. That's right. Well, to the extent that you'll find the New York Times re- reporting on it, it's because it's Donald Trump's fault. Huh. Uh, because he created this, you know, this environment in which this sort of thing. I, I can tell you that all of the people that are actually committing the crimes <laughs> are not doing it because they believe Donald Trump told them to do it. Hmm. As a matter of fact, most of them are happening. Uh, if, if, if any of these people have a political orientation, most of them are on the left. I was reading in the New York Times, actually, today. Uh, It was an editorial written by two self-proclaimed reformist or liberal rabbis talking about the need to address anti-Semitism, taking responsibility. The right should take responsibility for the right, and the left needs to take responsibility for the left. And this was in response to a school assembly back in November in the Bronx where a guest speaker equated Israelis with Nazis— and asserted that Israelis are an example of, quote, victims becoming the perpetrators. You know, they say these events have uh, broad importance and are reflective of a much bigger problem. Um, Anti-Israel activism has spread beyond the college campus. Now it's in the high school and elementary classroom. Mm Mm-hmm. The uh, curriculum in our schools, universities, and our our secondary schools uh, over the last 20 years has increasingly moved in a direction of radical multiculturalism. Radical multiculturalism is an ideology that has a whole set of different uh, ideas about identity politics, about race, about gender, about LGBT rights, and it's a whole collection of ideologies and one of the collections of those ideologies is the uh, on the multicultural left is precisely 
the anti-Semitism of the Palestinian cause. It's worked its way into the lexicon and into the canon, if you will. And so you get high school teachers that, well, I'm leftist, you know, I'm going to be teaching the canon, and that's on the canon. And so they just add it to the curriculum, and they believe this stuff too. Uh, and uh, because of... Uh, also, another thing that adds to the prejudice is that Israel has seemed to be friendly to the United States. And so if you're right. anti-American, right. and if you're an American and you hate your country, and, uh, and if you're a leftist who hates your country, and Israel is friendly to Donald Trump or to the American right, and, the, and Israel is seen as close to the American right, well, that means by definition you must oppose them. Huh. So it also fits into our political uh, polarization narratives between left and right as well. More and more, we're reading news about attacks in synagogues and schools, and even on the streets, people are walking. There's videos all over YouTube of, of people coming up and, you know, literally hitting Jewish people walking on the street. Um, we've covered it on, on this podcast before, but I've, I've noticed following you and, and, and watching you as one of the leaders here at the Heritage Foundation, that you, you're someone who looks at the short term, but you also look at the long term. Yes. In the short term, what, what do we do with this? And then, and then long term, how do we look at this? Well, the short term, you have to identify it as a problem and explain where it's coming from. Uh, and, and, and absolutely have zero tolerance on having schools or any of our public institutions verifying or legitimizing this kind of behavior and this kind of attitudes. Uh, so we have to, that, that's the, where you have to start because if you, don't, if you don't put your foot down and plant a flag on this, it's only going to get worse. And by the way, uh, there is a reverberation anti-Semitism on the left, increasing anti-Semitism on the far alt-right too right. because that means that they feel more empowered uh, and more emboldened to come out because they know that the political culture is now more open to it because, after all, you know, even these people over there and the left are saying this is okay now because of Israel and their hatred of Zionism and all mm. of that. So they, just, they sort of glum onto that. And so you got both extremes on both sides going for this. And so that leaves us in the middle uh, <laughs> to, to combat it. So in the, but at the very least, you don't tolerate it in the schools. Right. And I, I mean, not just in New York City, but anywhere. The second thing is... I, I really think that um, as Americans, we have to stop this uh, historical amnesia that the uh, that the country is now on. It's not just on this issue of anti-Semitism, but it's also uh, about the founding of the country. You know where we came from as a nation. Where it's really getting harder and harder to talk to, uh, to to Americans about what Americans are, what we stand for. And it's mainly because either they don't know about our history or what they do know is wrong. Historical amnesia. I am, I'm uh, still unpacking that and what, and what that means. My, my, my final question to you is, do you see a role for President Trump in this, or is this a local community solution? Uh, there is a role for President Trump. He actually is already... Uh, uh, issued a uh, an executive order on combating anti-Semitism on December 11, 2019, uh, and he issued it um, as part of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Huh. So he's already uh, gone on record of saying that the United States government uh, and the federal government should be taking a stand against this issue. He is... Uh, uh, notwithstanding the, the scurrilous attacks against him from the New York Times, uh, he is, uh, comes from New York City, and he has, uh, uh, and he, he has a very good feeling about uh, the Jewish community there. He's got people in his family uh, that are Jewish. Hmm. So uh, he has a, per a good personal feel about it. Uh, I think it's absolutely ridiculous to... Uh, accuse him of being anti-Semitic. Dr. Holmes, I, I really do thank you for coming in today and spending time with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that's it. Another episode of Heritage Explains is done and accounted for. Remember to go ahead and leave us a comment, or you can also send us an email at managingeditor at heritage.org. Also, 
Don't forget to leave us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcast. And most importantly, thank you for sharing with your friends and family. We'll see you next week for a new episode. Heritage Explains is produced by Michelle Cordero and Tim Desher with editing by Thalia Rampersad.